This episode is sponsored by our friends at White Charts. As Federal Reserve rate hikes continue taking center stage, financial advisors and their clients are naturally worried about the state of their investments. That's where White Charts steps in. White Charts just released their latest white paper, taking a deeper look into the performance of various portfolio allocation strategies and asset classes during the four most recent rate hike cycles. Get answers to questions investors and advisors are grappling with to help you make smarter investment decisions and navigate these dynamic market movements. Download a copy with the link in the show notes. And if you haven't signed up yet with a 20% discount that's special for listeners of the show, what are you waiting for? Click on the link in the show notes or visit go.ycharts.com slash meb2023. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Where do we find you today? I'm looking out your back window. Is that uh, not the Empire State Building? Where are you? I'm in my office in New York, and you're looking out towards the uh, the Hudson River where Sullenberger landed his uh, plane. It was right by- am, am I looking at like a little Canadian wildfire uh cloudy uh, sort of well, situation. You never know in New York City if it's Canadian wildfire or just normal day, but yeah. uh, I'm here in New York. Well, I'm, uh, I'm excited to have you today. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff, private equity, LBO, credit, but I want to rewind a bit because, and here's the intro prompt for you, is you kind of got your start when I'm assuming LBO and private equity, was that even a phrase? Like, did they call it that at that time? Like, what, what was the... I'm one of the original uh, private equity people kind of walking around. I, I came to New York on October 1, 1981, when interest rates were 15.84%. The 10-year treasury was at, you know, mortgages were 20, the 10-year treasury was 15.8. And uh, they were called going privates or LBOs, or it was just the whole idea was just starting. I was co-founder of Goldman's original private equity group. So the reason I say that is, let's see, my high school was named R.J. Reynolds High School. And so Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I definitely got to experience some of the, you know, I was young, so didn't really quite know what was going on, but definitely heard about the barbarians at the gate and all of the newspaper headlines were about that world. It was definitely foreign to me at that time, but did you ever have any involvement in that particular transaction or was that too early, different group? I'm very famous. I'm on page 259 of Barbarians at the Gate. I, you know, I was a young partner at Forrest and Little and uh, Ross Johnson comes in to see us, who was the CEO of RGR, and he was, should we do the deal, not to the deal? And Ted Forsman, I interviewed him and Ted Forsman asked me later, what do I think? And I said, I think he's totally insane and I leave the book. So that's my one uh, quote. I actually spent about four months working on it. Uh, my firm, Forrest and Little, was the second biggest firm in the world to uh, KKR at that time. So we took a very hard look at it and decided not to bid. But I'm happy I didn't say pay any price, use reset notes, or a bunch of other things. So, uh, but yeah, I did live through that. And, you know, I've, I've been involved ever since 81 in uh, the whole growth of the buyout. And by the way, a quick aside before we dig into private equity. When you talk to the younger cohort today, who really kind of only lived in this sort of very low interest rate world, and they start moaning about 5% mortgages, do you kind of sit there and say, listen, listen, kid, 5%, I mean, people still bought houses when they were 15 and 20. Like, how do you react to that? I do point out that, uh, you know, 4% 4% 10 year treasury or whatever are not the highest in history. And that, uh, you know, literally the highest interest rates in history were the day before I started work. And, you know, what happens in this sort of environment, I also grew up through 13 years of stagflation. The stock market was lower in 1981 than it was in 1968. Uh, the 70s were kind of a lost economic decade. We were I was trained in inflation accounting and all sorts of things growing up. And uh, so this is by far not the worst economic conditions. Yeah. You know, private equity, extremely well-established strategy, asset class today. But rewinding, you know, what is it, 40 years, what did the world look like then? I'm here in LA, so, you know, Michael Milken still has a big presence. It's now because he's a philanthropist and a, holds a conference that's, that's he's famous for every year. It's long forgotten, you know, Drexel. But what was it like in the sort of early days as this sort of industry began? Yeah, well, you know, I, I was Michael Milken's kind of sworn opponent back in the 80s. I'm kind of friends with him now and go to the conference and he's become a good philanthropist and doing some good things. You know, what you have to remember is that in 1981, when the interest rates were so high, 
the PE of the stock market was under 10. When I used to sit in the Goldman merger department, we would say, what would a company sell for with an acquisition premium? Uh, kind of 10 times net income was a full acquisition premium. A lot of companies are trading at six or seven times net income. Uh, interest rates were extremely high. What you had was after the original recession where Volcker broke the back of inflation, with, you know, the same way Powell's trying to prevent inflation and Reagan was involved with that, you had a bull market that started right around 82 or 83 that in one sense or another has kept going, you know, all the way. But back then, there were only 20 private equity firms in the world. I just finished being chair of the private equity industry, which now has 5,000 firms. And the biggest firm in the world at that time was 400 million, you know, was KKR Force Mill had 220 uh, million of assets under management compared to you know, Blackstone's a trillion or something like that today or close to it. So it's totally changed. And and what it's really changed, though, the big message I try to get off is back in 81, it was about risk creates return, use a lot of debt because you had a lot of inflation. So if you had 95 parts debt and five parts equity and 10% inflation, you could triple your money in a year with no unit growth at all, no management skill. Uh, and then as interest rates went down and the stock market went up, you had a lot of wind at your back. Over the 40 years, it's totally changed, in my opinion. When I talk about New Mountain, my firm today, we talk about it as a business that builds businesses. Where Forrest and Little had eight people when I left, my firm has 225 team members. It's just, you know, it's a form of business today, not a form of finance. Let's dig into that a little bit, because I feel like if you were to, you know, say the words LBO, private equity, people, the media has a very specific view of what that means. Often, I think they believe you know, this group's coming in, they're firing everyone. It's like the Raider mentality, Carl Icahn sort of, that's, that seems to be, to be the picture of the comic book, almost description. But what does it mean to you guys? Because you guys practice it, I think a little bit different maybe than industry wide, but you can give us the kind of, what does the industry look like today versus kind of what do you guys specifically look at differently? So again, I think private equity properly done has evolved from a form of finance into a form of business. So take on the job creation number. I think people still think of the old movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas on a giant cell phone at the beach, and they don't know a hedge fund from a private equity fund. You know, again, my firm, we're not a hedge fund. We don't trade in and out of stocks. We have private equity and credit. But in private equity, we are the owner of the business. We have operating partners. We you know, and we track things like job creation. We've added or created over 60,000 jobs net of any job losses. So we're not in there slashing jobs. We're building businesses. We've had $79 billion of enterprise value gains, and we haven't had one bankruptcy or missed interest payment in the history of the private equity firm. And we, you know, we do a social dashboard every year and update it. So it's on our website. You can go back year by year and track the job creation. But what it really is, I, I wrote a big article in Harvard Business Review last year about a company of ours called Blue Yonder that Harvard Business Review printed as a case study of how private equity can build businesses. And a company like that started as a little $600 million company called Red Prairie. We turned it into the world's leading supply chain software company. We added artificial intelligence to it four or five years ago before people were talking about it. We sold it for eight and a half billion dollars to Panasonic after a seven or eight year hold. I mean, that's what private equity is today. And, uh, you know, I can go through lots of other studies. It feels like it kind of has to be because if you look at the evolution and we think about this a lot with what we would consider to be sources of alpha. So looking back over the years, you have something that probably in the 80s and 90s, the reason it went from 20 firms to as many as it has today and, and the massive AUM is these great returns. So these outsized returns, they draw competition and this alpha from purely the arithmetic of how people kind of worked that business, once you start adding dozens and hundreds of firms and gazillion dollars, it has to become a true alpha generating value add source, right? I mean, that's, that seems like the way it is to me because um, most of the academic literature, I think if you wanted to just get like the average private equity manager, well, you probably don't want that anymore, right? You, the people always talk about you want to be, you know, in the top quartile or half or whatever it may be. So it would seem presumably that a lot of the value add would come on the actual work you have to do as opposed to just the financing transaction. Do you agree? Disagree? Does that sound about right? Well, I agree. One thing I would say is uh, all the statistics I've seen is that even the average private equity fund has outperformed 
public equities over one, five, 10, 20. Public equities have obviously outperformed, you know, uh, government bonds, which last year was, I'm told, the worst year in government bonds, long-term bonds since the Napoleonic Wars. Private equity did much better. So that's the average fund. There is a much wider dispersion of returns in private equity, say, than there is in public equity management because it is a skills-based game. And you know, it's like restaurants. So people say, what is private equity like? It's like saying, what is a restaurant like? You have everything from La Berna Den to the bodega with tomain poisoning because it's up to the people who run the firm, which what it really is, private equity is a form of governance where we're empowered. A firm like New Mountain is empowered with capital. We are given years to put it to work. We get to choose the industry, choose the management, choose the strategy, get involved in any issue we want to get involved in. And show at the end of the day that it was a wise to trust us. And that takes years to develop that trust with your LPs. And, uh, but it really, good private equity really is value added. So, you know, a company, some of your listeners might know about it, that trades on the stock market today as a Fortune 500 company. It's a business called Avantor. We bought it originally around 2010 for $290 million. Today it's worth over $20 billion. It was going to be a discontinued division of Covidian company called JT Baker. We renamed it, made it in Ultra Purity Life Science Supplies. It's now one of the, after Thomo Fisher, one of the two biggest companies in the world in lab supplies and so forth. And none of that would have happened as a orphan division within a big company. So it's industry selection. It's the ability to run things privately where you're not under 90 day pressures, totally rationally. You can attract better management talent if they're not just a division manager. This is really their company. They really have ownership and focus on it. And you can just do things better. So, I mean, I ultimately think it's a form of governance. When you invest in a company, what is sort of y'all's mandate on like how long you're going to hold these? Because traditional, when I hear private equity in my mind, I'm like, all right, you got a seven-year clock that's running for this fund. You either got to sell it, you got to do something with it. But you guys often, in some cases, tend to hold these companies for longer periods. How does that work at your shop? So at our shop, our investment questions at Investment Approval Committee have never changed. We're now a 23-year-old firm that's gone from zero of assets to 40 billion of assets. So we always ask two questions in credit committee. One, is it safe? Do we really think we can get our money back, hopefully with a double, even if the world is bad? And I can talk about how we try to do that. And two, do we really think we can make a 30% gross return or better if we achieve our plans? That's that's what we're trying to do to approve a transaction. The normal holding period we show on our computer runs is assumes five years, and some are out sooner and some go longer. And one thing that's happened to the whole private equity space in the last three or four years is a uh, concept of continuation funds where let's say you've had companies and they've run their full lifespan but they still have a chance to double or triple again over the next four or five years. There's now the mechanism of continuation funds where LPs can get cashed out at the mark or they can keep going and with a, you know, with some fresh LPs who want to go longer. So you have the option on the ones that deserve to be held longer. There's now a way to hold those longer with your LPs consent. So, uh, but the, the computer model is based on five years. Normally you mentioned briefly, um, and we can dig in here on, all right, we're going to make this decision to invest and we want to kind of be conservative that even if it goes bad, we're going to try to make a return. I'd love to hear you talk some more about that. And within that, how much harder has the sourcing and deal making become now that there's so much money and so many competitors? I mean, I, I imagine the early days you could probably find the enterprise value to EBITDA companies trading, you know, really low. And it's just like, you would have to like almost muck it up. And then now I imagine the valuations have increased. Maybe talk a little bit about how you kind of view that challenge. So let, let me talk about kind of how we, what sort of company we're looking for and how we set it up and then turn to how we source it. So we're very focused on protecting downside while going for high upside. And I'm not going to give my returns because I don't want to be accused of marketing on your show, but that's what we're, that's what we're shooting for. The safety factor comes from a few things. To me, one of the great, great luxuries of private equity is you get to choose what industry you want to be in for the next five or 10 years. So, you know, I come, my grandfather and grandmother had a store selling winter coats in Detroit, and I grew up in a family business. And one of the great luxuries, I don't have to be 
standing in a store in Detroit selling winter coats in the mall. I get to be in life science supplies or digital engineering or we're the biggest manager of wind and solar and EV charging stations. So, so number one, you can pick an industry that's good for the future. You're not stuck in aluminum smelting for your entire life or because almost no industry stays good forever. Most, most companies have their time in the sun and then it gets very hard. So one, we can always be there for the right time. Two, a firm like mine usually only uses four times debt to EBITDA on average as we buy something. Much, much lower debt levels today in private equity than there were back in the early 80s in the, in the original days of private equity. And we'll talk about our, you know, we have a $10 billion credit arm as well. When we lend to those type of companies, we're usually under 40% loan to value where the private equity sponsor is putting in over 60% with his own money and we're the senior 40%. And we're even more conservative than a normal private equity firm when we buy and sometimes use no debt at all. So it's not about levering up a bad industry and hoping things work out. Three, that most debt today has no covenants except to pay the interest. So you don't get triggered by a, a weird reporting rule and you have time. And if there's ever a problem, which does come up periodically, we have a team of 225 people. We have 35 full you know, operating partners on our staff and 40 others that we call on, plus we employ 67,000 people or, or more than that actually would be one of the largest companies in America if we were a single company and we can put an operating skill. So that's how you protect the downside. And the upside is as you're buying these businesses, besides whatever growth plans they have, you have your own plans of let's, you know, we, we normally buy like a $500 million size company that a founder might've built or an, a division that was of, you know, a forgotten division. The founder may never have built his sales force, may never have done an acquisition, may never have taken his company around the world. There's usually so many things that even a good founder hasn't done or a good little niche mid-market company hasn't done that we could add. And that's how you get the big return. So it's really, it's not about taking more risk. It's about safety and business building. Yeah. I was just thinking in my head, like one of the challenges, I do a lot of startup investing and yours is obviously a little later stage, but the challenge of seeing a magical business, like the one you were talking about, invested at 200 million and then seeing it roll and get to the point where everything's working, it's compounding. And I imagine it is, it becomes at some point a pretty tough decision on, hey, we are kind of getting to the time horizoning of selling this, but actually we think this could be a $20, $50 billion company. We saw Sequoia start to, you know, do some new fund offerings where they're now managing public stocks and stuff like that. How often does that become, you know, where you guys are sitting around debating and we're like, well, what do we do here? This thing is, I mean, it's a good problem to have, let's be honest. So that's, again, where this continuation fund idea comes in. So, so one other thing I should say is, uh, let's say you start with a debt with a company with four times debt to EBITD and the earnings go up and the debt goes down. You can set the debt back at four times EBITD on the higher EBITD and be able to pay money out to your investors. So there are ways to be paying cash out to the investors and get their risk off the table before you sell the company. And then let's say you've gone to the end of what is a normal holding period for a private equity firm. You know, you've you bought it three years into the life of the fund and you've held it for five years. So your investors have been with you for eight years on that, you know, on that fund. Again, if you really do think you can double or triple again, you can let the investors who are tired get out or just want to have liquidity get out. And other investors in the GP can say, well, we're taking this company with investors who want to be there for the next five years and keep it going. That's the continuation fund idea I was talking about. What's some of the uh, opportunities look like today? Is this a pretty fertile time? Is uh, the romp up in interest rates causing any gyrations, good or bad, in the industry? What's the world look like in 2023? Again, I, I think private equity has been one of the strong performers through this very difficult period of COVID and inflation and everything else we've been going through. And I, I think if you just look at the asset class, it has outperformed. And I'm very happy the way my own firm is performing. And it's partly because, you know, on private equity valuations, when you have a private company, it's based like our valuations are half based on discounted cash flow, a quarter on merger comparables, and only a quarter on public trading comparables. And even there, you rarely use the most extreme optimistic comparable. So you don't, you just don't get thrown around as much. If your earnings are growing and you're going off of DCF, you don't get the gyrations you can get with uh, 
the market sometimes. And I'm also not talking about the unicorn, no earnings type companies. I'm talking about you know, uh, more established. So private equity has been a, has really outperformed again at, you know, in this last period, I don't think it's a fake. I think it's, it's, there's truth in that. And then the current environment is that deal volume is way down because the line of companies that want to sell is probably longer than ever. They don't want to go out in this interest rate environment, announce an auction and fail and be embarrassed. They're not quite, you know, there's a still a meeting of the minds of where purchase prices are versus seller expectations. That's still settling. Uh, but for a firm like ours, we've continued to be very active, both selling, like we just sold a company called Signify to CBS earlier this year at a, at a good multiple because it was so strategically important. To see. And we're still buying. And what we're doing is, I didn't get into this, but, you know, we pick the sectors. We have 12 sectors and 25 subsectors. And this gets back to the sourcing that I forgot to answer, where we have team leaders and full teams in every one of these sectors we've chosen top down over the years. They're scanning hundreds of companies in those sectors. We look at a thousand companies a year in confidential letters to buy 10. And so in this environment, when people are scared to sell, it's a better time to go out and approach them and say, hey, Meb, we know you want to sell. You don't want to say it, but we've admired your company. We've tracked you. Let's go off and negotiate. So we're doing those type of purchases. We just did a big carve out for Perkin Elmer that some of your readers may have read about a couple billion dollar piece of all their lab equipment and life science uh, supplies and all that. That, And because carve outs, the corporation wants to do with someone they trust to get the deal done and it's about certainty. So we're doing that. And there are you know companies that have fallen in stock prices that might be good go private. So, so there's lots to do, but you, it's not just uh, big auctions. When you say 12 sectors, is it basically everything you're looking at or are there certain areas that you're kind of more drawn to or, you know, seeking out? You know, we've slowly evolved this list over time. We have a top-down process we've done every year for about the past 20 years to say, again, if we're looking forward for the next 10 years, what has the chance to grow good or good times or bad for the next 10 years? So again, we're not in fashion retail. We're not in aluminum smelting. We're in things like life science supplies, healthcare IT digital engineering, smart energy transition, those type of businesses. And we have 12 sectors staffed up with, a, with senior operators, senior deal partners, operating partners, younger people, every expert we could find. It's like fishing holes. We hope every one of those will produce fish and you can catch two, uh, two in one month in, no, in one hole and nothing in the other, and then it could switch next year because they're all productive areas. And we only buy when we cross that investment thresholds that I described to you earlier. Now, compared to your question, how was it in the old days? In the old days, when I was at Forrest Malittle as the second biggest firm in the world during the RGR period and all that, we had only eight team members. I was the New Deal guy. You know, we had the founders, the Forrestmans and stuff. I was basically the senior guy outside the Forrestman family. And I was like, you know, the rug merchant. I would sit and let the investment bankers come in and lay their wares out before me and go, not that one, this one. Uh, that's not how the world works anymore. Now, a good private equity firm is super knowledgeable in a space, super strategic, has done other deals, really knows the space, has real insights. It's not just the the generalist banker saying, oh, I'll lever that one. I mean, it's really evolved into a much, I think, a much better field as it's gone on. You mentioned earlier the Harvard Business uh, case study, and we'll put a link in the show notes. By the way, listeners, Harvard Business Publishing does like two or three hundred million dollars a year in revenue. It's like talk about <laughs> talk about great businesses. They have a good one. But anyway, you had a comment called talent per dollar ratio. What do you mean by that? Yeah, this to me is a really, really key point of private equity that I tried to refer to. What I mean by that is what management talent, what investment talent can you apply to any given company, you know, at any given size company. And again, I, you know, I only want to talk about the ones that are kind of public that I can refer to, but a, a business like Avantor, when it started, was a small, it was the 13th and smallest division of a public company. It got no attention. It wasn't the future of their business. It wasn't on anyone's. So what sort of great manager is going to dedicate his life to be a division manager of the 13th and smallest division? You're just not going to get the best talent. You're not going to get the best thinking about it. And it's a little bit like taking the kid out of the orphanage and bringing it home. And now it's your kid. When that business comes out and it's owned by a firm like ours, we have ownership. I mean, what carried interest means is besides putting, 
you know, we put over a billion plus into our own companies of our own money, plus you share in the profits. So a great manager would like to come over and run that business because now he's an owner. He's not a division manager of a conglomerate. He's the person building this business and we can build teams plus our own firm that gives attention to a company it could never get as either a family business that can't access that or a division of a big public company that can't access that. Yeah. One of the things that uh, you alluded to, but I'd, I'd love to dig in because we haven't spent that much time talking about it on the show. We, we talk about private equity um, a fair amount, but private credit and direct lending, what kind of portion of y'all's overall pie? Is that a big piece, a little piece? And then what does that actually mean for the listeners? It's a very important piece of our firm. It's about 10 billion of our assets. Part of it trades publicly on NASDAQ called New Mountain Finance Company that some of your listeners may have seen or looked at. We also have private versions, which we call Guardian. We have CLOs. And the way we do it is there's a total uh, overlap of skill sets because, you know, again, if you pick an industry that should be a very good industry for the next 10 years, and you know it deeply, and you don't buy the equity because someone else buys the company, we use that same analytical team to drop down and say, well, we've never had a bankruptcy or missed an interest payment at the equity. We can be a lender to this business that some other firm bought, and uh, we've had an incredibly, uh, you know, a very good track record in credit where our I, we have extremely low uh, basis points of loss in credit because we're using all the knowledge of an owner of businesses to make the loan decision. And we're generally under 40% loan to value. So let's say there's a great software company and another private equity firm buys it for 20 times EBITD. We can be the senior six or seven clicks of financing with 13 or 14 clicks of equity underneath us. And you know we feel very good about the safety of that load. So uh, that's how we play it. And the great thing about private, I think private credit or non-bank lending is one of the great still kind of undiscovered asset classes. It's getting more discovered all the time, but you know, it is floating rate debt. So as interest rates have brought up, it's been better than, it's not like fixed long-term fixed bonds that got killed. It actually got better as rates ran up. And you can have very sophisticated teams making very specific loans versus a general you know, bank book. We also don't have, you know, deposit or bank runs, you know, something like our, our public arm is permanent capital and you're not subject to runs on the bank and some of the things that the government's had to bail out. So it's been a great asset class, I think, socially, great returns, and we really like it. Who's really adopted it? Has it been institutions mainly at this point or like the big real money shops? It's probably 30 or 40% institutions people who like dividends, because it's not meant to be a stock that appreciates. It's meant to effectively trade at book, but the cash yields, I'm simplifying now, and I'm not trying to promise anything, but they've been basically 10% cash yields every year. And then as interest rates run up, they're closer to 13. It's the sort of expectations people have. And then you have full liquidity because you can trade in and out. There are private versions where you don't have the the volatility of stocks trading. You're not as liquid, but you also don't have to worry about marking your book to market every day. You market more to just book value every day. So it, it plays uh, both ways. To the extent you can, would love to hear an example, and you don't have to mention the exact name, but a, like a recent transaction, like kind of walk us through like almost like a case study of how you think about a deal in this direct lending private credit world versus like a traditional private equity LBO. Like I also wonder if like there ever comes to you like, hey, this is interesting LBO. Like actually just kidding, we're not gonna do this, but we can do the lending side. Maybe just to give the listeners a, a little more color on how how something like this would work. Yeah, so again, take uh, the software sector, which is obviously gonna be a good sector. So I mentioned the Blue Yonder deal, which we bought a software company, we paid a low multiple because it was a sleepy little business and we spent years building it up. So that was a private equity deal. Now, there are many deals done by other firms like Vista and Toma Bravo and other firms that are buying software businesses. They might be great fundamental franchises. Let's say it's an enterprise software business with 10,000 clients. It's a good franchise. We know the franchise. The question is how much does someone want to pay for that? So let's say Vista or someone pays 20 times EBIT. We don't necessarily want to go outbid them and get into an auction and pay 21, but we feel very comfortable lending six or seven. You know, we first look at it, uh, are we going to buy control? 
we only generally do that where the seller wants a relationship with us, doesn't want to put us through an auction environment, more mid-market type companies. If we're not going to buy it, but it's a good company, we immediately tell our credit people, well, we're not buying it, but you may want to lend to it. And so it's a little, you know, I use bad analogy. It's like a fishing boat. You go out to catch a marlin, you hook a 500 pound tuna and you get to keep the tuna. You know, you're out fishing, you know these spaces and uh, it either fits in one bucket uh, or the other bucket. That's going to be a nice tuna, man. You can sell that thing on the market for a pretty penny. That's the goal. As you guys probably have more lines into CEOs, operating companies, both portfolio companies, but on the lending side too, what's the feedback about, here we are, summer 2023, about the economy, about what's going on in the world? It feels like, you know, everybody keeps waiting on this recession to happen. Everybody keeps waiting for the Fed to stop raising rates and on and on, inflation to come down. What are they saying? What's the feedback from uh, your portfolio companies? Yeah. You know, well, what I would say, again, the, you know, big picture uh, armchair economist, uh, and this is not to favor one president or another president, but the, the, uh, the U.S. economy had already started to come back strongly in 2020 under the former president. So GNP was up, I think, 33% Q3 of 20, 7% in Q4 of 20. Uh, I think the government overstimulated, you know, in 21, uh, the, uh, or in 20, I guess, the, the, the uh, Fed didn't stop them. And so what we saw at our companies, because we own about 40 companies in 40 different industries, we, you know, we see it, we get a lot of data just real time by owning different businesses. The worst inflation and the worst labor shortage and supply shortage squeeze was really around September of 21 before people were talking about it in the newspapers. We could see how how much it was hitting our businesses. And we worked with our businesses at our level to really manage them through it, how to ask for pricing, how to control supplies and so forth. You know, the story ever since then is the Fed's been trying to catch up to the inflation to stop it because they didn't want to go through the stagflation of the 70s again. And everybody's trying to figure out when they're going to stop doing that and when when will enough be enough with the Fed. So obviously we're up into the fives. That's what crashed long-term bonds. That's what, you know, that plus bad management crashed Silicon Valley Bank and almost killed the banking system. And the actual economy inflation is clearly lessening. Labor is loosening up. Things are not that bad. The real question is, when will the Fed say, hey, it's good enough and not keep beating up the economy? I mean, I, I think James Gorman said he was happy with fours, you know, 4% unemployment, 4% inflation. I'm not sure the Fed's going to settle for that. They, and so the the worst thing is if they just keep, they may just keep banging and banging to try to get inflation all the way back to two, which maybe that last couple percent of inflation may be really tough to squeeze out and very miserable. So I think that's the biggest risk is just how tough the Fed wants to be to, to not just, you know, let things be okay, but to actually get back to their target. I describe it as rainy, soggy weather. It's not like a crisis like 07 or 08 was a crisis, COVID was a crisis. Our businesses on the whole were up, you know, double digit earning growth last year. Our portfolio was up even more than that because we made exits. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're just kind of soldiering on it. If you have a weak company with over levered and you can't pass on price, you will see more defaults. But in general, for a, 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 a reasonably strong company, it's just kind of like rainy weather. Yeah. As the listeners who are allocators are thinking about this asset class, these style of strategies and funds, how should they think about it? I mean, is, is private equity, is it just carve out of their equity exposure for the institutions you talk to? Do they, on the private credit, is that simply a carve out of the bonds? Like, how do they think about it? Or do they put it in some alt bucket where they're like, this is something totally different? What's the best practice for someone who's going to make an allocation? Yeah. Well, one thing I just read this at Institutional Investor, so I'm not sure, or Pension and Investments, I guess, you know, that the, the 60 40 model may, is slowly evolving potentially to a 50 30 20 model, where 20 is private assets in general. Look, I think for private equity, it's very much dependent on all private equity is not the same, the same way all restaurants are not the same. Who is the manager of the fund? What is their style? Are they value added? I think it is. In general, it's always been a better time to go into the asset class after the bad news hits. So, I mean, the worst thing to do is to say the market's down. Now I'm not going to invest in it because, number one, these funds get drawn over, you know, three to five year periods. And number two, the best opportunities as a buyer with new money 
is after the bad news, not at the boom. You can't, it's almost the reverse of the rear view mirror as far as how to pick when to enter. And the best private equity people, institutions, just allocate every year, you know, to the class of the best managers they can find. On non-bank lending, floating rate credit, I just believe it's been very much underutilized by institutions. I always wonder why a pension fund who's desperate to make 7% doesn't take floating rate debt at 10%. And say, well, that made my life easy. Why they wanted to be in fixed income at two or one or zero. I I mean, that's a huge risk, which obviously has hurt them in the last year. Also, I would say if you look at the public debt funds, the BDCs, they traded much higher yields than REITs do, much higher yields than other income do because it's a newer class. I don't think it's been well understood. And it used to have a much weaker set of managers 10 or 15 years ago. Those guys are out now. It's you know, I think we're good. You have, you know, uh, Aries and KKR and Blackstone, and I think more professional organizations. So I think it's an underutilized fixed income yield uh, best thing that, that people should use more. When it comes to this, and you don't have to narrow this just to private equity and uh, private credit. So feel free to take this wherever you want. I have a long running Twitter thread where I talk about Views that I hold that the vast majority of my professional peers do not share. So 75%. So that's if I say something, all my professional friends would be like, no way, dude, that's crazy. What do you view in the, it could be the investing world, could be specific to private equity and credit. Anything that's non-consensus in your mind? Yeah, I got a bunch of them. I got a huge amount of them. Good. Well, let's dig in. All right. Well, let me start with one. People always say risk and return go together. Risk you know, you must take more risk to make more return. That is wrong. I mean, that assumes a, an efficient market casino where skill has no role in it. If I go into the boxing ring with the heavyweight boxing champ, I will have all the risk and he will have all the return. Risk and return do not at all go together because boxing a game is a game of skill and he has more, he's a better boxer. So when you hear the mathematical models, they're assuming, and this is, you know, and in public equity investing, it may or may not be true. I'm not a public equity investor, but, you know, you don't have to bet more at roulette. You have to pick up the ball and put it in the slot you bet on. And that's called owning a company, managing it, understanding it deeply. I mean, that's what, so it, I don't agree with this general assumption that risk on, a return only comes from more risk. I think that misses the whole glory of investing, which is to actually build a business or really understand something different. The funny thing about that is like, you know, for a long time when the academics started talking about factors and beta being one, but it was actually like, not only was risk not aligned with return on a very academic public stock sense, it's actually 180 degrees backwards, right? And so a lot of the low volatility funds that have come out and ensuing years have demonstrated actually that if you invest lower volatility versus higher volatility, it's actually a better way to invest. It's one of those funny sort of quirks of thinking about the world that should be, you think in your head, it makes sense to be way, but then it actually is uh, opposite, which I love. You mentioned you got a few. Anything else come to mind? Well, so that, and on the risk return, again, I'm not trying to comment on public equity investing, but I'm talking about where you can actually own the company or credit where you really can deeply understand it. We put a big emphasis on industry selection as the first key thing to think about because what I've seen in in my, you know, my 40 plus years is that the biggest mistakes are when the industry melts underneath you. I mean, if you, not to hit on anybody's deal, but if you buy a toy store in the mall against Amazon from the day you made that decision, your ability to manage it, to fix it, you know, you've kind of set your fate or if crypto melts and you have your money in crypto. Or back in the year 2000, everyone was in the alternative telephone CLEC space that melted. So that's why we spend a lot of time on what sectors do we want to be in, you know, for the net. We're going to hold it for five years. Someone's going to think about the next five years. So where do you want to be for the next 10 years? And you can always go where the world is going or the puck is going. So, I mean, we, we spend, we start with industry selection. Another thing I would say is, you know, the other way I think people should think about the world is there are 8 billion people getting up every day in the world trying to make their life better, their family better, their neighborhood better. So there are always positive streams of something going on in the world, some idea, some avenue, some improvement. And what we try to do at my firm is pick those positive streams, join them, accelerate them. And, uh, you know, that's the fun and kind of the 
the, the, and that's a non-cyclical, non, you can do that in all times. Another thing I would say that's a little bit, you know, people talk about, well, venture capital versus private equity and where do things fit? The other thing I would say is there are some venture capital ideas that are much more successful if you take the venture capital idea and apply it to a safe private equity base with cash flow and customers. And so like, you know, just as an example, we had a business called Cyox started by the head of biostatistics at Harvard and the head of biostatistics at MIT, one of the two great companies in advanced math, you know, for drug trials. There was a little VC software opportunity that's essentially a, like a chess computer to run a billion permutations of a drug trial. We could have been a standalone VC deal, but we bought it, put it in as a product line of this company. And again, they have cash flow, customers, sales, people, credibility, and it's a much better way to build that business. So it's not that VC builds companies and private equity kills them. It's private equity starts with a safe base and then adds technology and growth to it. And, uh, you know, so that's that's somewhat contrary to some way some people think about VC. Uh, on growth, I've been on growth panels where people start off defining the growth category as no earnings. I go, wait a second, that's not how we think about growth. We think about growth as growth, like you grow, you know? So there's a lot of things where we're a little different than people, but I think it's extremely common sense. Pick a good industry, keep it safe, treat it like a family business, you know, and build it. I was smiling as you were talking about the toy stores. I mean, I spent a lot of time in Spencer Gifts as a kid. I mean, I like just salivating over those pining for the lava lamps and the plasma balls and all the other and the black leg posters i used to go to spencer gifts all the time yeah so yeah uh, the older crowd can uh resonate with that the younger crowd sorry but i don't know what the modern equivalent would be but man they were awesome you know so let's say someone's going to allocate to private equity uh to private credit and say it's not your firm but just sort of like al if let, let's say you were allocating to a manager sort of like what sort of question main one or two question would you ask about assessing their skill at actually building businesses so not just like identifying a deal but like all right i'm gonna ask this question to kind of truss out if these guys are any good yeah it's a very difficult and important skill to distinguish one private equity from from the other and you know there there are gatekeepers like hamilton lane there are some great staffs at the pension funds and the institutions so it is itself a very sophisticated form of investing and i think the key things are you have to analyze each firm the way you would a business. I mean, what is their strategy? What is their team? Are they going to keep the team together? Are they in, will they evolve as the world evolves? Because sometimes people, you know, had the lucky, you know, they were all great in oil while oil was rising and their record is great, but that's not necessarily the right play for the next five years. I mean, is it a sustainable uh, culture and, and, and an approach? And, uh, you know, are they really building it versus wa wasting it down over time? I mean, what's the talent coming up? How do they split the carry? A firm like mine, everybody gets carrying every deal for the receptionist on up. We build our talent from the inside. There's dozens of things about building a, a good firm that we could talk about separately. But so it, it, there's a ton of analysis on, uh, on just what is it as a operating business? It's an operating business, not an investor. The question we've been asking everyone at the end is, uh, what's been your most memorable investment? I mean, this could be at your company, it could be on your own, it could be good, bad in between, but just like first one seared into your brain, what comes to mind? Well, in the first, you know, I've had kind of two acts in my career, you know, the, the Goldman Forceman Act for the first 20 years and the New Mountain Act for the second 20 years. In the first 20 years, the company I was most proud of was a business called General Instrument that I owned for Forsman Little from 1990 to 1999. Started as a very mucked up conglomerate. We uh, focused it down and turned it into the world's leading cable and satellite television equipment. Everyone thought Japan was gonna destroy the, all US electronics companies. We fought back. We were the US uh, HDTV standard that no one ever thought a US company could invent. We helped do the cable modems and video on demand and that whole world that we're all used to really came out of that company over and it went from a billion of value to 20 billion in the 90s so that was what i was most thinking about when i started new mountain and a new mountain it's just been uh, what i care most about new mountain is the firm itself i don't take credit for any individual deal so what i'm most proud of is new mountain as an institution and how we do things but we just had a great sale on signify this year went from 500 million to 8 billion in a very bad market or 
Avantor or 290 to 20 billion. So there's a lot of good ones, but I really think about the institution as the not a deal anymore. So as you look to the horizon, you mentioned first 20, next 20, what are you thinking about? What are you excited about? What's on your mind, either for yourself personally or for the company um, as we look out into the future? What's on the brain? Yeah, I mean, I, I love and I tell young people this, you know, I love the private equity field and the credits part of that and and have remained very excited about it. First of all, I'm a terrible golfer, don't have a sailboat, bad at everything, would much rather be have a nicer day in the office than be lost in the rough or something on the golf course. So I like what, but what's, what's so fascinating about private equity is what I just said. You can choose where you want to be for the next number of years. So anything that's exciting, interesting, uh, a positive trend in society, we can become part of and move. We're not stuck in whatever we inherited from our grandfathers. We're always going to be moving that way. We could actually build things. We can do it under the covers of privacy where we, we don't have to explain it to people. We just have to come up with the right end result. And the institution has gone from me all alone in a rent office 23 years ago with zero dollars to, you know, some of the best operating people I think there are around. And, you know, we employ, uh, you know, over 70,000 people at our companies. And I mean, it's just so it, building things is just a huge fun. And I think we're better at it every year. So I'm, I'm going to, as long as uh, I have good luck, I plan to keep doing this. One of your interests outside of work that is a big passion is, is thinking about education. What's some of the initiatives you're working on there? How do you think about that in a, in particularly this weird post COVID world, internet dominated AI taking over everything? Uh, how do you think about education? What's the, some of the ideas and concepts you're working on? So I, you know, along with business, I try to, you know, I, first of all, I think business is a good thing socially. So I'm not trying to do charity to make amends for business. I think business is a positive uh, way to live your life. I'm very involved in education and children's health charities for a long, long time. And the main ones there, they're after school centers in New York and the public schools that I first set up about 30 years ago in memory of my brother who passed away that still run, that's New York Times has written articles about. So I still do that. I'm the chair of Harvard's public education policy group one interesting thing in my career is I took a year off between Forest Hill and New Mountain, was in Harlem in a church basement with, uh, you know, writing the application for the first charter school in New York State. So I was very involved in charters, which I still commend, but the politics are just so terrible that I've just gotten off the playing field years ago on that. We did a podcast with Joel Greenblatt and some others talking about some of the struggles with uh, with that. So the politics are vicious. So I mean, and, and, and I'm pro public schools in every form, but I just try to make some good public schools. But where, where I'm really active now in my major thing, and I hope your listeners uh, do pay attention to it, is there is a way to really help lower the cost of college for lots and lots of people by using basic old fashioned internet technology, you know, to create a public library of college courses for everyone in the world. So I created something called modernstates.org. 400,000 people are using it. It's the biggest free college for credit charity in the world, I think. And what we did is very simple. There's a set of exams from the college board, like the advanced placement, but they're called the CLEP exams, where anyone of any age could take them. And let's say you pass the college algebra exam and go to Ohio State or Texas State or whatever. They say, oh, you came in with college algebra done. So you save the time and money for that course. We hired 33 of the best professors we could find in the country had them do a course, which we paid for now give away for free to everyone at modernstates.org with readings, with practice questions. And then we pay the exam fee. So there, you can get basically one year of college at almost every state and community college in the country, plus private schools, not not at Harvard, but at Ohio state, Michigan state. And uh, that's called modernstates.org. So if anyone in your family, your neighbor, your distant cousin, you know, someone you know wants to help pay for college or dropped out and get back to college, they should check out modernstates.org. I love it. Kind of last question, you know, as you think about this world of personal finance, uh, you know, people love talking about, is it teachable? There's not many high schools that teach investing for sure, but even personal finance at its core. So what's your suggestions or do you have any kind of general ideas on the best ways to think about educating, you know, sort of the adolescents all through even college age on this topic? Yeah. Well, again, you know, the way I think about business is it's a creative act as part of the whole human society 
organizing itself better to make progress, whether you're a songwriter or you're a scientist or you're a manager or you're owning a company and reorganizing it and improving it. It's all the same creative instinct to organize the world and make it better. And business is one of the most complex forms because you're dealing with multiple people in different industries. So I'm a big reader of history. I was an economics and philosophy undergrad who reads nonfiction all the time. My head of private equity, who's one of the great deal partners around, was a literature major. It's not, it's not mathematical modeling. It's, it's understanding the world, society, people, how to build organizations. And to me, doing the education charity or doing a new mountain transaction is the same exact thing. I would tell people to read history, learn the world, see where it's going, figure out what you want to get involved with. And it's not a finance course. Steve, it's been a whirlwind tour of everything uh, private equity credit and even more education. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really great to be on your show.